This beautiful tank is called FV101 Scorpion. This is a tank produced by Alvis Vehicles in England and was created in 1973 for the British Army to try to basically create a very interesting, very fast, well protected and also quite uh, mobile and ridiculously uh, easy to produce tank for the British forces and also for the export. And although in terms of armament and in terms of armor it's not particularly special, it is a very very fast tank, it actually has the Guinness world record for the fastest tank ever uh, with a speed of 82 kilometers per hour which was recorded in 2002 and it's also an amphibious vehicle so it can actually cross uh, water it's also protected from nuclear biological and chemical attacks and is all in all a pretty interesting vehicle and today we're going to discuss this vehicle and also talk about the war where it participated welcome to what the math And today we're going to be talking about this tank and also about the Falklands War, the war in 1982 that the uh, United Kingdom participated in um, against uh, Argentina. And uh, this was actually the first battle that this tank has seen. Now, um, to make this video a little bit shorter and a little bit more entertaining, I'm going to divide this into two parts. In the first part, we're going to talk about the tank itself, but also we're going to discuss the naval warfare that uh, United Kingdom had to prepare for this particular um, war. And then in the second part, I'm actually going to try to recreate the Falklands Island invasion where this tank participated and we're also going to see how it does against a much more superior Argentinian force. So when this tank was produced it was basically uh, produced to be a reconnaissance vehicle, a very fast, uh, very mobile but also well protected with some uh, really good weaponry as well and to, to make this uh, more diversified they've actually created several models. One of them is called Scorpion which is what uh, you see here and this is a tank that has a 76 millimeter gun that you uses um, heat uh, and also high explosive ammunition uh, but there was also another model that was known as the scimitar this was actually FV-107 scimitar here's a picture of it and this was a uh, pretty much the same tank except that its gun was a 30 millimeter cannon that I am going to be using in the next part in the next video that was actually um, a, more fast firing and had a lot more anti-personnel use uh, but uh, together these two tanks were often used in, um, in unison in order for them to kind of complement each other because they basically had the same chassis and had the same speed and same everything else and one of them would be more responsible for destroying enemy uh, light armor vehicle and the other one was more responsible for getting rid of the infantry. And all of the divisions that had these tanks had um, eight of, of each so there would be eight uh, scorpion and eight scimitar tanks. And interestingly, when this vehicle was being developed, um, Alvis Vehicle actually wanted to make this a perfect sort of a design and they actually had extensive uh, cold weather and hot weather trials. So they took their model tanks in, um, to Norway and they also took them to Australia, to Abu Dhabi, to Canada. And they had some really interesting trials for each of their models just to see how they do in different types of weather. So in a sense, the actual design and the actual production value of this tank is pretty high because it, it managed to survive both the super hot and super cold weather and it was actually very mobile and was super fast as well and all of these vehicles were quite light as well they, they were only at about eight ton uh, weight so that meant that they could actually be um, air transported which is why Royal Air Force Regiment also purchased quite a lot of these tanks and because this was meant to be a reconnaissance vehicle it was also obviously amphibious it could cross rivers but it also was meant to have very low ground pressure meaning that um, it was meant to uh, move across boggy uh, conditions and specifically this was actually meant for in case there was ever invasion into the Soviet Union um, one of the reasons why the German tanks failed was because they got stuck in the boggy conditions all the time basically whenever they would enter swamps they would start sinking and would not be able to move anymore because they were too heavy and here the boggy conditions would not be a problem anymore because this tank was very mobile. And because this vehicle was actually seen as quite successful and quite an interesting design, it was purchased by many different countries, uh, specifically countries like Chile, Honduras, uh, even Iran had uh, something like 130 different tanks. And a lot of these countries still use them today as well. And uh, many of these tanks were converted to different uh, purposes. So there's actually a striker vehicle, which is the anti-tank version. There is a uh, Spartan vehicle, which is the APC meant for to transport troops. There is Samaritan vehicle, which is the 
the ambulance Sultan vehicle, which is used as a command post, and a few other modifications by other countries, including one from Iran that's actually called Tosan, which is technically their version of this tank, because even though Iran was able to purchase these tanks before, it was no longer able to purchase them later on, so they had to develop their own. So all in all, this was actually a pretty interesting vehicle, um, which is why Britain actually used it in uh, most of their engagements and serious conflicts. And specifically, the two conflicts where it was actually used actively were uh, the Falklands War and the Gulf War. Now, Gulf War we talked about in one of the previous videos, but today we're going to talk about the Falklands War. And here, this was actually the only vehicle, armored vehicle, used by the British Army and was meant as both the reconnaissance vehicle and the support vehicle for the commando and the paratrooper troops that were trying to retake the Falkland Islands from the Ar Argentinian forces. Now in the next part we're going to obviously talk about the land invasion and we're going to try to recreate it but here we're, we should start with the uh, idea of the naval war because if you look at the map Falklands uh, are really really far away as a matter of fact they're much much closer to Argentina than they are to England so how did England manage to actually not only get there but uh, participate in this war and eventually win? It. But before we would talk about all of this, so let's just quickly discuss the island. So back in uh, the early 19th century, here we're talking about before 1832, there were actually no permanent residents on this island and previously many different colonists lived on this island. Uh, and here we're talking about colonists from Spain, colonists from France and also colonists from England. So this island technically didn't really belong to anyone. Now in 1833, Britain came to this island and actually reasserted its rule with the military, with everything. And they brought their ships, they brought their army, and back then England was very powerful. So even though Argentina got a little bit upset and they actually tried to protest, they really had no way of trying to reclaim the islands because their military was not as powerful as the British army. And so ever since 1833, this island was technically under the British protectorate and all of the people that actually live on the islands today are technically born there and they even refer to them as the Falkland Islanders, meaning that they basically, even though they're technically British and they, they are from Britain and they speak British and it, they even drive on the left side of the road like in Britain, Nevertheless, they consider themselves to be a completely different culture. But nevertheless, on April 2nd of 1982, Argentinian forces actually invaded the islands with about 600 of their own troops against about 57 uh, British Marines that were stationed here. They then established their own uh, military base there. They basically tried to dig in and uh, didn't really expect England to do anything because, well, first of all, look at the map again. This is how far away England is. And despite the United Nations resolution that demanded for Argentinian forces to withdraw, uh, Argentinian forces decided to stay where they were and basically started to create their own base there. And in order for this mission to be successful, Britain had to figure out the logistics of supplying their ships, supplying their aircraft, and basically supplying their army uh, something like 8,000 miles away from, from England. And so here, the main problem for Britain was, of course, the distance. This uh, was about 13,000 kilometers away from the British Isles, meaning that to try to supply their force so far away was actually quite difficult. And so what they decided to do is basically bring everything they needed with them, trying to uh, bring a very very large expeditionary force that actually had quite a lot of supplies with them and essentially resupply everyone and feed everyone right there at the sea and so what they did is bring close to 100 ships with them uh, a lot of those ships were actually troop transports ferries um, whole trawlers tankers basically everything uh, that they needed to survive for quite a long time uh, at the sea they also had two uh, aircraft carriers with them and quite a lot of different missile frigates and missile destroyers as well in order to confront the Argentinian Navy, Argentinian Air Force, and basically try to retake the islands. Now, this was actually a very ambitious task because Britain didn't really have any experience leading this kind of warfare, and even by today's standards, this was actually quite an achievement. And considering Argentina actually had a lot more aircraft and uh, quite a lot of ships uh, of their own in that region, this was also a very dangerous task. But nevertheless, Britain decided to send everything they had, and they used some of their submarines to try to scout the area, but also uh, they managed to sink at least one ship using their submarine. Although unfortunately for Great Britain, the sinking of the ship really really pissed off the Argentinians and they actually managed to use the French Exocet missiles that were uh, state of the art by, that, by those terms and actually are still really good today. And these missiles were responsible for the anti-ship warfare. They could actually be delivered to their target using either air
aircraft or helicopters or ships and a lot of the British ships actually had them as well but Argentina was trying to purchase more of these rockets or these, these missiles from France and both England and France tried to stop them from doing so because this would actually put uh, the British ships into a lot of danger but nevertheless they had at least five of these missiles and they were able to use a few of them to destroy one of the um, British missile destroyers called HMS uh, Sheffield. It actually was launched from the French aircraft called Super Etendard and this, this was also obviously purchased by Argentina from France and so ironically it was the French missile launched from a French aircraft that destroyed the British uh, ship. But nevertheless, the British task force actually made it to the islands and they used their missile carriers, their missile frigates, missile destroyers, and their aircraft carriers to try to basically scare away any other Argentinian ships in the vicinity, destroy any aircraft that approached the islands, and essentially were preparing for the land invasion. And because the uh, airfields on the islands were actually too small for the jet aircraft, all of the Argentinian airplanes actually had to launch from their mainland. But nevertheless, the Argentinian forces were still launching quite a lot of aircraft against the British uh, vessels and also against the British forces that did land on the islands, but they weren't really that successful. And to prevent any surprise attacks, what Britain did is use their five submarines to essentially make a perimeter around the Argentinian air bases. And whenever the airplanes from those bases took off and uh, basically proceeded to try to attack the British ships, the submarines would actually warn them in advance without really being detected themselves. So here was actually a very clever use of submarine reconnaissance in order to try to protect their own ships. But I think the most interesting operation uh, during this particular conflict was actually an attempt by the British forces to try to destroy the rest of the exhausted sto uh, stockpile, the missiles that would actually be, be able to destroy the British ships by sending their own special forces, uh, also known as uh, SAS operatives, uh, to try to basically infiltrate the Argentinian army base and destroy all of the rockets there. And the name for this operation was Mikado. Now, even though the actual the actual operation did start and they even sent a reconnaissance team to try to establish uh, a base of operation for the main strike team, due to the bad weather, uh, the helicopter actually had to abandon its operation and essentially they ended up in Chile. And the SAS soldiers that were on this helicopter actually ended up just surrendering to the Chilean police, explained everything to them and were then rep uh, repatriated back to the United Kingdom and sent back on the normal civilian airplane. But interestingly, Argentina actually panicked because they knew something was going to happen and they even sent 2,000 troops to try to search for these SAS pilots and SAS soldiers to try to basically discover them on the border with Chile. But despite uh, facing so many dangers from these uh, missiles and also from the constant air attacks from Argentina, British forces were actually preparing for the main strike and here they used their commando forces to land on the islands to try to take them over. But we're going to try to recreate this the next video and so watch out for the part two because we're going to do a ground battle against argentinian forces and we're going to try to defeat them but meanwhile thank you so much for watching hopefully you enjoyed this video and hopefully you learned a little bit about the falklands war and also the tank itself and don't forget to subscribe if you still haven't and also like this video if you've enjoyed it share this with your friends share it with your family share it with everyone you know thank you so much and as always game you guys later and bye bye